Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, the show where we talk about space this week. We saw lots of cool stuff happen, from Russian rockets soaring from launch sites across the world, to SpaceX bombastically blasting off from the US, to robots landing on the moon. Lots to unpack, but before we get going, make sure you've hit that little red subscribe button down below so that if YouTube is feeling particularly kind, it'll notify you of these videos as soon as they're live so that this news is right up to date to start your week off correctly. And with that, let's begin the show, delving into our first segment, all the stuff that happened last week. The first event of the week is a follow-on from a launch we talked about last Monday and was of course the December 1st success of Chang'e 5's Lunar Lander. This Chinese uncrewed lunar lander is expected to return lunar surface samples back to Earth on the 16th of December, so here's hoping the rest of the mission continues with the same success that it's enjoyed so far. We also saw a few launches last week, the first of which took place on Wednesday the 2nd of December. This was the launch of an Ariane space-operated Soyuz rocket launched from the Guiana Space Center in South America. On board the spacecraft was a Falcon I-2 reconnaissance satellite for the United Arab Emirates Armed Forces. The satellite was built by Airbus Defence and Space and Thales Alenia Space and is called the Falcon I-2 because, unsurprisingly, it's the second Falcon I satellite to be launched. The Falcon I-1, which was launched last year, sadly didn't make it into space after a failure with the Vega launch vehicle, hence why the UAE got Falcon I-2 and why the launch vehicle this time around was a Soyuz rocket rather than a Vega. I'm glad to see that this time things seem to go without a hitch. Our second launch took place the next day on December the 3rd and was another Soyuz rocket, this time operated by Russia themselves, which launched from the Plesetska Cosmodrome, carrying four satellites to low Earth orbit. Three of these satellites were the latest GONETS M satellites to be added to the Russian GONETS satellite constellation. GONETS, when translated into English, means messenger, which is a fitting name considering that these are civilian communication satellites. The fourth satellite was an ERA-1 satellite for the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation and, as its client's name would suggest, will be used for the Russian military. Russian rockets are always reliable machines, so I'm glad to see that these two Soyuz missions succeeded. It's no surprise that Russia knows a thing or two about rocket building though, their expertise goes all the way back to the early days of the space age. One of my favourite early Russian programmes is the Lunacod programme, which you can learn all about in this great documentary on Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream has an immense library of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows that span a wide range of topics from from history and nature to science and technology. Curiosity Stream has a plethora of award-winning exclusives and original shows and is available on a huge number of platforms, meaning you can stream their content to any device for viewing at any time, anywhere. Just use the code MATLOWN or simply click the link in the description to get 25% off and pay just $15 for an entire year. And with a massive library and 35 collections of curated programs handpicked by CuriosityStream's experts, that is an insanely good price. I've been a huge fan of CuriosityStream for a long time now and I cannot recommend them enough. Give it a go, for just $1.25 per month, this is the best value streaming service money can get. Keeping to the subject of Russia, we'd hoped to see them launch their newest prototype rocket, the Angara A5, on December the 4th, but unfortunately this has been pushed back to December the 14th due to a technical issue. Hitches are always going to be expected unfortunately as the Angara class of rockets are still very much in development, but will eventually replace Russia's Proton launch system once they're ready to enter service. Here's hoping the problems can be fixed and the launch isn't delayed any further. Moving on to our next successful launch, it took place yesterday on December the 6th from the Zichang Launch Complex in China. The launch vehicle was a Long March 3BE and on board was the GFN-14, an Earth observation satellite for the Chinese State Administration for Science, Technology and Industry for National Defense. Our final launch of the week also took place on Sunday the 6th and was the latest crew supply mission to the International Space Station carried out by SpaceX with their trusty Falcon 9. 
With the crew one dragon still docked to the space station, if the resupply dragon makes it there in one piece, then there'll be two dragons docked to the space station. Excitingly, in addition to the cargo dragon, the Falcon 9 was also carrying a brand new International Space Station module. It's called the Bishop Airlock and is a commercially funded airlock module that'll be used to deploy CubeSats, small satellites and other external payloads. The name refers to the Bishop chess piece, which moves diagonally. The module will attach to the Tranquility module and it doesn't have any hatches itself. Instead, the Canadarm2 can connect to one of its two grapple fixtures in order to move the airlock on or off the station's berthing port, which does have a hatch. Because it has two grapple fixtures, the airlock can be moved up to the mobile base system along the main truss of the space station, making it a very versatile component. All in all, very exciting stuff, and I can't wait to see SpaceX hopefully see this through to successful ISS docking without any issue. The Falcon 9 first stage booster landed back on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, just over 600 kilometers downrange from the launch site, bringing an end to the 100th successful Falcon 9 mission and fourth flight for this particular booster. Those were all the launches that took place last week, but there are a few other noteworthy happenings to discuss. On December December the 1st, we unfortunately saw the collapse of the iconic radio telescope at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. After the supporting cables for the 900-ton suspended platform gave way, sending the structure plummeting into the dish below. The telescope was the world's largest single aperture telescope for 53 years, surpassed only in 2016 by one in China. At this stage, it's unclear whether the dish will be demolished, rebuilt or left as is. I'm personally hoping it gets turned into some sort of racetrack, Just Cause 2 has shown me the light, or maybe a giant skate park. I joke, of course. Observatory director Francesco Cordova has stated that they will investigate ways of establishing similar or even better scientific capabilities, perhaps at or near the site. Of course, this is very much dependent on if the facility can secure the necessary funding from the US Congress. Perhaps the most exciting non-launch news was the successful sample return of Hayabusa 2. This Japanese spacecraft spent six years traveling to the near-Earth asteroid 162173 Ryugu. Upon arrival, it collected samples from the surface of the asteroid and on the 5th of December, Hayabusa 2 flew past Earth and released the sample storage capsule. And a short while later, this successfully landed at the Woomera test range in Australia, bringing an end to its 5.24 billion kilometer voyage. The samples will be curated and analyzed at JAXA's Extraterrestrial Sample Curation Center, where international scientists can request a small portion of the samples. Here's to any and all leaps and bounds we can make from the data we can gather from the asteroid samples. And I suppose, since we're not talking about rocket launches, now is as good a time as any to head on down to Boca Chica, Texas to check in on SpaceX's Starship. I once again refer to Brendan's great work on keeping up with the Starship development. He produces these high quality infographics on a regular basis, so I highly recommend checking out his Twitter, link in the description. As you can see, Starship's SN9 to 16 are well under construction, and we finally had confirmation that SN13 and SN14 exist. Up until recently, we've only been able to really infer their existence as parts have been spotted for the SN15, but now we've had confirmation of the methane header tank for the SN13 and the down cumber pipe and aft skirt of SN14. Really though, the question on everyone's minds is, when will we see the SN8 launch? SpaceX now plan to fly the latest and greatest completed Starship to 12.5 kilometers, slightly lower than the previously planned 15 kilometers, today! December the 7th. This might change though, perhaps even by the time I've uploaded this video, but hopefully we'll see the beast fly before the week is over at the very least. The photographers are primed, so all we can do now is sit back and wait for things to happen. But that's a wrap on last week's events. Let's now take a look at what's in store this week. But before we do, guys, I must once again shamelessly ask that if you're enjoying this video, then do consider leaving a like down below to show your support. It's always appreciated. Anyway, back to the subject at hand. Let's take a look at some rocket forecasts. <laughs> Guys, the 10th of December is going to be wild. We have not one, not two, not three, not five, but four launches to look forward to. 
Our first will be a Falcon 9 carrying the SXM7 satellite on behalf of Sirius XM Holdings Incorporated, which is an American broadcasting company. The SXM7 and its sister, the SXM8, are high power broadcasting satellites for Sirius XM's digital radio service. They're both equipped with a large unfurlable antenna reflector, which allows for broadcasting to radios without the need for large receiver dishes on the ground. The SXM7 and 8 will replace the tired XM3 and XM4 satellites, which were launched in 2005 and 2006 respectively. This mission will be the second time SpaceX fly a Falcon 9 booster for the seventh time, and the first time a commercial payload is flown on a Falcon 9 with more than four flights under its fins. The booster will land around 650 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, and the fairings are expected to be recovered by SpaceX's fairing recovery fleet as well. The next December the 10th launch will be Rocket 3.2. This will be launched by Astra and will be the next test flight of their Rocket 3 launch vehicle, which is an orbital small sat launcher. We covered Rocket 3.1 quite a bit on this show a few months ago, but the launch attempt of this prototype back in September sadly ended in flames after a first stage failure resulted in the rocket plummeting back down to the Alaskan surface. Hopefully Astra have fixed the problems and things go a little bit more successfully this time around. Rocket 3.2 completed its final static fire test on the 25th of November, with each of its five Delphin electric pump-fed engines providing over 6,500 pounds of thrust a piece. Here's hoping that the Rocket 3.2 gets a little bit further than its predecessor. The next December the 10th flight will be, oh my goodness do my eyes deceive me, will be the Delta IV Heavy Enrol 44 mission. This has been delayed quite a few times since the summer and has suffered a couple of aborts literal seconds before liftoff. Hopefully United Launch Alliance have once and for all solved the issues with their most massive launch vehicle and we can finally watch this orange leviathan take to the skies. On board is a classified spy satellite for the National Reconnaissance Office, which will be placed in geosynchronous Earth orbit. The final December the 10th launch will be over in China and will be a Long March 11 booster taking flight from the Zichang launch complex. The payload will be a GCAM satellite for the Chinese Academy of Sciences. GCAM will study gravitational wave astronomy and its name is an acronym that stands for Gravitational Wave High Energy Electromagnetic Counterpart All Sky Monitor. Say that three times fast. <laughs> the next day, on December the 11th, we will see Virgin Galactic reattempt their suborbital flight of Spaceship 2, VSS Unity. We'd hoped to see this fly earlier last month, but due to COVID-19 concerns and a statewide lockdown, the flight was delayed to December. Hopefully things go as planned this time. The crew expects to fulfill a number of objectives on this flight, including testing elements of the customer cabin, as well as assessing the upgraded horizontal stabilizers and flight controls during the spaceship's boost maneuver. On board will be some scientific payloads on behalf of NASA as well, and the crew themselves will be dressed in Virgin Galactic's newly unveiled spacesuits, which were designed in partnership with Under Armour. Wearing the spacesuits on Friday's flight will be Chief Pilot Dave Mackay and Pilot CJ Sturko, who is expected to become the first person to fly to space from three different US states, with the success of this mission, which will be the first space launch from New Mexico. The final launch of the week will be on the 12th and will be Rocket Lab's The Owl's Night Begins mission. Man, I do love how Rocket Lab named their flights. This, of course, will be an electron rocket and it will once again be taking flights from the Mahia Peninsula launch site in New Zealand. The rocket's payload will be the Strix Alpha satellite on behalf of Japanese Earth imaging company Synspective. The mission is called The Owl's Night Begins because of the Strix satellite's ability to image millimeter level changes to the Earth's surface from space independent of weather conditions and at any time of the day or night. Strix is also the genus of owls. Rocket Lab won't be recovering the first stage of the electron this time around, as they're still working away studying the recovered electron from their previous flight, the Return to Sender mission. But the Owl's Night Begins is the last of the expected flights of the week, so now it's time to take a look back at our roots. Yes, it's the time in the show where we look back at all the best historical anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. <laughs> The journey of our history segment starts today, December the 7th, in 1972, with what's going to be a recurring topic in today's anniversary list, the launch of Apollo 17. 
This was the final Apollo moon mission, and as we go through this week, we'll be able to track its progress. As the mighty Saturn V staged away and the crew cruised towards the moon, they took that famous blue marble photograph, one of the most iconic pictures of Earth ever taken. The same day, in 1995, the Galileo spacecraft arrived at Jupiter, just over six years after being launched by the Space Shuttle Atlantis during STS-34 in 1989. Galileo's mission was to thoroughly study Jupiter and its moons, and it did this exceptionally well. The probe discovered that the frigid world of Europa, Jupiter's fourth largest moon, had a saltwater ocean beneath its icy surface. It also found extensive volcanic processes on the moon Io, and a magnetic field being generated by the moon Ganymede. It wasn't just the Jovian system that Galileo gathered fascinating data on. En route to Jupiter, the spacecraft encountered not one, but two asteroids, Gaspar and Ida, which was the first time a spacecraft had encountered an asteroid. It also provided the only direct observations of a comet colliding with a planet, and during one of its gravity assists of Venus in 1990, it took some fascinating infrared images of the planet's clouds. The Galileo spacecraft was destroyed in 2003, after eight years in the Jovian system and 14 years in space overall, after NASA made the decision to terminate the mission with an explosive finale by sending the probe into Jupiter itself. This was to avoid the risk of the spacecraft crashing into one of the moons of Jupiter, potentially contaminating it with terrestrial bacteria. Tomorrow, on December the 8th in 2010, SpaceX became the first private company to successfully launch, orbit and recover a spacecraft. This was the first Dragon mission, which flew aboard the second ever flight of the Falcon 9. Unfortunately, there's no Falcon 9 landing to talk about. It would be five years until the first successful Falcon 9 first stage recovery, but this was still a significant flight and a huge achievement for SpaceX. A few days later, on December the 11th, Apollo 17 touched down on the surface of the moon, becoming the sixth and final time astronauts would land on the lunar surface. The two astronauts, Eugene Kernan and Harrison Schmidt, began their first extravehicular activity, or moonwalk, <laughs> four hours after landing. They deployed a variety of experiments and visited several lunar locations in the lunar rover, and two days later, on December the 13th, they conducted their third and final moonwalk, and to date are the last humans to set foot on the surface of the moon. The crew of Apollo 17 successfully splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on December the 19th. But that's a wrap on all the coolest anniversaries due to take place over the next seven days. Another week of space news is upon us. I do hope you enjoyed today's summary of events for last week, this week, and of course all the anniversaries we're most looking forward to here at Space This Week. And I really hope you enjoyed this video. And remember, do check out Curiosity Stream using the link in the description, curiositystream.com slash mattlown. $15 for an entire year of high quality documentaries is an insane value for money, especially when you compare it to other streaming services, and I absolutely cannot recommend them enough. There are, of course, other things you can click, such as the on-screen cards. The left is a link to the full Space This Week playlist if you want to see more videos like this one. The video on the right was chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. Hopefully it was a good pick. There's also a link to subscribe, so you can click on that to make sure you get notified of these videos as soon as they go live to make sure the news is as up-to-date and relevant as possible. And that's it. Goodbye.